I needed to fix my situation in this country because I was going to die. My own country is a complete mess. Like, there's no way I was going to be able to make it over there. Hey there, my name is Sean, and this is Suicide Noted. On this podcast, I talk with suicide attempt survivors so that we can hear their stories. Every year around the world, millions of people try to take their own lives, and we almost never talk about it. And when we do talk about it, many of us, including me, aren't very good at it. So one of my goals with this podcast is to have more conversations and hopefully better conversations with attempt survivors. I want to thank everybody who has joined me here on this podcast, who has shared so openly and so honestly since we launched in 2020. And of course, to everybody who listens and for a handful of people who support us on Patreon, huge thanks, much gratitude, really. And stay tuned in the coming weeks and months. We will have some special episodes where we will revisit with some of our attempt survivors. We'll start with 2020 and get an update on their lives. So stay tuned for that. If you are a suicide attempt survivor and you'd like to talk, please reach out. Hello at suicidenoted.com or on Facebook or Twitter at Suicide Noted. And we are talking about suicide here on this podcast. So please take that into account before you listen. But I do hope you listen, because there is so much to learn. Today, I am talking with Jose. Jose lives in Florida, and he is a suicide attempt survivor. Hey, Jose, how's it going? It's going well today, yeah. And I actually started a new job today, which was very, like, by the end of the day, I'm exhausted. Because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm paying attention to everything that I'm doing you know, I'm around these people that that seem much more outgoing than I am. And I put myself in this category, like of almost like a victim, you know, they're looking at me, and they're talking about me. And it's awful. It's it's pretty bad. But I've left jobs before, because of how I feel how they make me feel. So I'm trying to keep this one because it's not a it's not a bad job. It's, it's an easy job. It's at a Mm. warehouse. And I actually like the people. So I'm hoping that this works out, but it's a whole process for me to get there. Like, it's not just, you know, everyone feels nervous on their first day of school or uh, first day of a new job or whatever. But for me, it's like this whole process of getting prepared for that. And I even sometimes I, I drink, I have to drink, like I have to actually take alcohol. Too, <laughs> too. Me too. I've ha- I have a, I have a, a weird relationship with alcohol and uh um, yeah. Sometimes yeah. I have a little too much. Yeah, and it, it's not it's not healthy, you know. But I I'm not a drinker, but to relax and and to be in the moment and to not think so much, alcohol does help me. But other than that, I don't really drink. Like when I go out, I just keep it. I keep it to like one beer at the most. I'm and I'm a very slow drinker, so one beer would last me for like two hours. It's just the moments where I'm very nervous, very anxious, and I just feel like I need it to just chill. Otherwise, it's a movie in my head. And and that's what makes me depressed. Yeah, just like um, two weeks ago, it was, I hope we had communicated like two weeks ago because I was feeling horrible. Mm. I was feeling pretty bad. I was thinking about death, you know, and I was talking to my sister about it not, not long ago. And I just opened up to her and there were things that she didn't know. I researched about death. I'm fascinated and I'm actually, it excites me. The fact that death is so easy to grasp, like to find, like if I wanted to kill myself, I could do it. Like, you know, I could find pills and, or Mm -hmm. like myself. And that's what keeps me like saying to myself, like, well, if I don't do it today, you know, there's always death tomorrow. I could. I could do it tomorrow. You know, I that kind of like makes me feel better. That is not a hard thing <laughs> to find. I don't know mm-hmm. how to I don't know how to say it. It's not a hard thing to to get to. You know, mm-hmm. like if I wanted to climb a building and jump and it's just not hard. You know, I try to I try to see it that way instead mm-hmm. of just torturing myself and telling myself 
no, don't think about death. Don't think about suicide because it's bad. You know, there's people here that love you and I, I, I'm sick of, of hearing that. So um, just try to create my own dialogue with myself regarding that topic. Very personal. I'm actually pretty nervous right now. So I'm trying to find a, my comfort zone there. You know, it's hard to, even when you read it online and on social media, you know, memes about depression and anxiety, you're not alone. You're not alone. It's hard to believe that. It doesn't matter uh-huh. how many times you see it online. It's really, it's really hard to believe that. It's almost like you have to meet someone with whom you can interact and they can yeah. tell you about their lives. And that's even very hard to find. Those type of friendships, friendships right now are very superficial. They're all like in the outside. Uh, and I don't say this because I'm an introvert, but I feel like introverts in general, they're that kind of people that really value their emotions and the way they feel. And they're willing to talk about those things. But the thing with introverts is like, if you're an introvert and I'm an introvert, you know, one has to take the first step. <laughs> like if you, like you, if you meet one of them, you know, uh, mm-hmm. we're both shy. So who's going to, you know, who's going to take that step too. But, you know, a lot of people don't do social media and or don't like social media. I don't I, I don't agree with that. Like, I, I think social media is a good outlet for people like me to express mm-hmm. themselves and to write and to communicate here. Like, to tell to other people, hey, I'm here. I struggle with all these issues. If you're hiding behind a keyboard or your cell phone, it's OK. Like today, I went to this new job and I was very nervous, very anxious the entire day. But I don't really have anyone to talk to about that. I talked to my husband, but, you know, that's a different kind of relationship than having a friend. I feel like, I don't know, I I know people on Instagram that they write poetry and they take pictures of it and they post it. You know, it's obviously people that want to express something and they want other people to read it or through photography or through art. You know, I I like to paint and um, all my paintings are tend to be pretty dramatic, pretty out Mm -hmm. there. (laughs) And I take pictures of them and I post them on Instagram because I want other people to see them and I want other people to relate to what I'm trying to communicate. The gay Mm -hmm. community is tough. It's really tough when I say that, but the straight community is tough too. But yeah, but you're the default. People accept you for, you know, for being straight. You know, you don't have to, you know, go around trying to hide. Like just, again, just today at my new job, like all these guys, you know, and talking and, you know, and they joke and very straight. And I'm like, fuck, I, I hope I don't look so gay. You know, <laughs> <laughs> like I think about those stuff. Where are you from originally? I'm from Venezuela. I lived there till, till I was 17. And then where, and where are you now? I live in San Pete, Florida. Okay. And how old are you? 38. I'm about to turn 39 in March. All right. You look young. Oh, thank you. So okay. you're in your late 30s. You're from Venezuela. You live in West, uh, West Coast, Florida, if I'm not right. West Coast? Yes, is the West Coast. You're married? I am. Yeah. You have yeah, attempted suicide or someone who has ideated a lot? No, I have attempted. I attempted. How, yeah. how many times have you attempted, like it, whatever you consider an attempt? Uh, three times. Three times. All right. Yeah. All right. You're in the right place. <laughs> How is it that you are in a very small percentage of human beings that found a podcast with the keyword suicide in it? What were you looking for? I'm always looking for suicide stuff. It's something that I'm always researching about. Just curiosity. Most people, and you know this, I think, they're not curious about that. Right. Yeah. You are. I am. Any idea why you think it's just a sort of natural I mean, suicide? People avoid that like the fucking plague, right? Yeah. Oh, definitely. Nobody wants to talk about death. Nobody wants to die. I mean, like some people may say I'm not afraid of death, but I don't know. Well, when you say you're like looking at, are you looking in, you're curious about it, clearly. Because I'm in pain a yeah. lot of times. Like I said before, suicide seems very easy, not in a bad way. It's an option it's that I have. It is an option. And I'm happy that I have it as I get really tired. And so I, yeah, I Google suicide and I research about celebrities that have killed themselves. Why they were so happy and they had so much money. Get very curious about that. But ultimately, because I, I get sad, I get sad and depressed and anxious. 
Does your uh, husband know that you're having this conversation with me? He does, yeah. Okay, and he knows the nature of this podcast? Yes, he does. Why don't we, can we start with the first attempt? Sort of how old were you? What was going on? Well, I started thinking about suicide in like my mid-20s. Okay, so what after you're in the United States? Yes, yeah. Okay. Um, I started developing depression in my early 20s. And then suicide came to my head. Like, yeah, like in my, I would say like in my mid-20s. My first attempt, I was living in San Francisco. With your sister? Yes. Um, she got a job. Uh, we were very close. We're still close, but we were closer before. And she invited me to come over and just live with her. You know, over there, I was, I just became very lonely. San Francisco is a beautiful city, but it's not a nice city. People are very snobby, at least in my community, because when you're gay, you look for people that you can relate to. And then you want to be part of that group. Mm. You know, and of course, you want to hook up with guys and shit like that. <laughs> but I was having a very hard time with that because I've always felt different from the gay community in, in general. Like there's a lot of hooking up and sleeping around and, you know, without it being, meaning anything at all. And I've mm. never been like that. And I also didn't have any friends over there. And my sister, who was really my best friend, she went into a relationship while she was there. And that made things more complicated in, in the sense that I was feeling very lonely. And I already had depression from when I was, you know, from before moving to California. It's a complicated. When I came from Venezuela, I was living with my family, with my parents in Florida. Sure. Before I went to California with her, I, I went out yeah. by myself, which I never do. I was terrified. Probably I met someone, I don't remember, but I got really drunk and I made it to uh, back to the apartment. And I was already taken, I was only taking Sanix. I remember I, I had a, a bottle of Sanix, but I was really drunk and I, and I just spilled the whole bottle on the bed and I started counting the pills. Okay. I just wanted to see if I had enough pills to just go. And <laughs> this is really stupid. But I called my other sister because I have two sisters. Uh, I called my other sister here in Florida and she was on the phone with me. I think she started crying or something like that. And eventually yeah. I passed out. When I woke mm -hmm. up, the pills were in the bed. I talking to her on the phone. She was trying to calm, calm me down. Yeah. And I just fell asleep. That was the first time. When you woke up, were you like, man, I wish I didn't wake up? When I woke up, I had a hangover and I kind of felt embarrassed uh, okay. because I did remember what I tried to do. And I remember talking to my sister on the phone. Well, this was a while ago, so I'm trying to remember exactly how I felt. I didn't even feel like embarrassed about the fact that I couldn't do it okay. because I knew other times could come. I just felt embarrassed about calling my sister really I would have preferred not to call her and just you know make the decision on my own and that's probably what would have worked mm -hmm. like if I had just not called her I could have maybe. probably swallowed the pills maybe it was a cry for help not even in that moment but after days and weeks after I mean you're in San Francisco I think still I mean do you want to be alive or is it really like I want no, like no I'm, I'm depressed like the entire time I'm there after that, I'm depressed. I, I'm dating this guy who lives four hours away and I'm only dating him because of the company, like mm -hmm. to find happiness. No, I'm, I'm miserable. Uh, and I go to a psychologist. I don't have insurance. So I found this really like, kind psychologist that lower the price for me. Just to mention, during this time, I'm working under the table. I don't have papers. Mm -hmm. That's a big part of <laughs> like my anxiety and depression that's right. how it all starts but I'm miserable I think about death every day um I don't I didn't attempt it but it's a constant thing I talk to my mom on the phone I talk to my dad on the phone I interact with my sister here my other sister she's full on in this new experience you know new relationship so she doesn't give a shit about what's going on around her. And I'm alone. Mm. I'm really alone in this, you know, pompous city. I walk by myself, but I don't have any friends. I go to work. I come back home. And I'm like, this sucks. 
Mm-hmm. So I just, I'm, I was really like, I'm surprised yeah. I didn't that again. How long are you in San Francisco for? I shortly after that, I decided to come back to Florida okay. to be with my parents. So your parents are in Florida. You're there. Yeah. And um, in between the first one and the second one, are you getting any sort of therapy or other kinds of treatment? Not really. I'm getting Xanax from my mom. It's the same medication you almost use to end your life. Yeah. I'm right. just getting I'm just getting that from them because they have weird things in their head as well. So yeah. they take they take Xanax. So I tell my mom about what's happening to me and all that. Oh well, here, take this. You know, she thinks she's a doctor. So she's just and my aunt, she suffers from depression and she's been through the whole depression crap too. So I get I get the Xanax that way. I don't remember when I started going back to a psychologist or a psychiatrist, but uh, eventually I met my husband. Okay. Yeah. And I just put it all out there. He's uh, this conservative gay, (laughs) believe it or not. He's down to date me. And I just, you know, I tell him what I'm going through. It was like, hey, this is my life. I'm out of status here. I don't have papers. You know, I struggle a lot with depression and I don't have a car. You're going to have to pick me up at my house. I live with my family. This I opened up this this dating account. So that's how we met. I met him. I, like He fell from the sky, basically. Like he's not like other gay men that I've met in the past. Well, I mean, yeah, you married him. Yeah. After a year. I loved him when we got married, but I needed to fix my situation in this country because I was going to die. My own country is a complete mess. Like there's no way I was going to be able to make it over there. So I just, I don't see myself going on. Like there's other things that came in the way, but it was just things like sure. attacking me from all angles. I had been under a student visa when I first got here. And then I was taking classes just to keep the student visa because then I was in a two-year college. After that, I would have had to transfer to an actual university to finish my other two years. I couldn't do that. Like my family didn't have the money to pay for that. And I didn't, I couldn't work. It was a mess. It was a complete mess. So I was just, this is ridiculous. Why would I want to go through this? I'm in my best years and this is how I'm going to spend it. This is the years when, you know, kids that graduate from high school, they decide, okay, I want to go to this college. I hope Mm -hmm. I get accepted. Oh shit. What what do I want to go to school for? You know, all these type of things. And I couldn't do any of that, you know, and I'm bringing this anxiety from when I was a kid because the anxiety didn't start around that time the depression did but I've always been very anxious since I was a kid it was just very confusing once I was with my husband things starting calming down because he just decided to help me out okay like full on you know we started going through immigration processes and and just trying to get my green card and you know that's why when people say just come here legally that's all bullshit they don't really know what they're talking about it takes a lot of money it takes it takes a lot of patience and it's it's a process that could take years so you're with your husband Mm -hmm. and there's a second attempt when does the second attempt happen the second attempt happened we went to New York for a short amount of time because he got a job over there, but it was like no more than three months. And then I tried to get a job over there so that we could just stay there because I love New York. I actually got a really good job over there. The first day I had a panic attack and I couldn't go back. He was like, okay, we have to go back to Florida. It's probably not going to work here for us, especially for you. New York City is nuts. It's just wasn't fitting well with my personality. And I was really disappointed. That just broke my heart. And I, we came back. I didn't want to go back to my parents' house. So we rented this room at a friend's house. So the first day of, job of my work he, here in Orlando, we moved to Orlando with this friend. I had another panic attack. I came back home. I didn't go back to work. That morning that I got up actually to start getting ready, the second day of that job, I just broke down and I grabbed the pills from the cabinet. I mixed them all. At that point, I was already taking antidepressants. I already had found a psychiatrist that was prescribing me with other medicine. I think it was Lexapro. 
and I mixed all the pills. He heard the commotion or something. I, was, I don't know. It just happened very fast. And I was trying to take them, but he just grabbed them from me and he's very tall. So he just, and I'm very short. I'm only five, three. So he just kept holding them in the air and I was just trying to grab them from his hand. I just, I was just done. And I would have swallowed them if he hadn't stopped me. He called my entire family. <laughs> I was really pissed about that. But what, what else is he going to do? I had like an intervention at my parents' house. My one sister in San Francisco on the phone and the other here. They were just talking to me, saying the same shit. You know, we love you. Uh, if you, well, my mom, my mom is very dramatic. So she was saying stuff like, we love you. If you, if you die, you will kill us all. Mm. You know, stuff like that. And I'm like, well, I mean... But it's my decision. It's like me, you know, it's my pain. It's like, I kind of don't care what you guys feel, <laughs> you know? I just, I'm just so tired. I'm exhausted. Mm-hmm. It's, it's like, I don't belong. I remember I just, I kept saying that. I just don't belong here. When was this? This was in 2018, November of 2018. All right, so that's three years ago. All right, so obviously you live, you don't take the pills. Your husband yeah. does what he does. You got, yeah. talk to your family. Does anything in your life change after that intervention? Throughout that time, I was jumping jumping from psychiatrist to psychiatrist because I'm very picky. Like, I don't really trust them very much. Um, I feel like they're just kind of like full of shit. <laughs> but I knew that somehow I needed to get the medicine. If I lived in Mexico, I'd probably get it, you know, just walking to the pharmacy. But in here, you know, it's a whole deal. So I need a psychiatrist because I'm depressed and I need to take antidepressants. I'm jumping from doctor to doctor and I'm taking, I start taking medicine. They switched me to Soloft. This new doctor that I found, uh, she switched me to Soloft and I started taking that with the Xanax. That didn't work. You know, I'm taking that. Eventually I arrived at, you know, my third attempt. Which was when? 2019, October. Pills? No, I tried with a belt. So that was the first time you, new, new method. Yeah, I was working for Amazon and I'm having panic attacks every time I have to go to work. And my husband wasn't here. I kind of thought, oh, how is it that Robin Williams did it? So I tried to research that method. Well, I did research mm-hmm. that method and I put the belt around my neck and mm. the end jammed uh, between the frame of the door and the mm. door. And I just raised my legs up. And I, yeah, you can feel it in your neck pretty badly, <laughs> but I did And you let go? What'd you do? I just stood up. I stood up and I just opened the door and took it out. Like, so it would have worked, do you think? Probably, yeah. Do you yeah. wish it had? I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. That's a hard one to answer. It's a hard question. Yeah, it's like ambivalent. It's yes. Probably at the moment, probably at the moment. Yeah. I yeah. probably would have wished I did that. Oh, fuck. Yeah. Did you ever get a diagnosis that you think is correct? Depression, anxiety, and the latest psychiatry that I have, he says that I may be OCD. I never thought about that. My doctor, she's not a psychiatrist, but she said, these are not actual diagnoses, I guess. Uh, She said something about agoraphobia, but I've been diagnosed with depression and social anxiety. Gotcha. Um, how many people in the world, let's go back to the first, so you had three attempts. How many people in the world knew about the first attempt? I know that you called one of your sisters, mm-hmm. but she didn't actually know that you were about to attempt, right? Uh, no. no. So does anybody in the world know about the first one? I don't think my parents know about it. Or if, if I told them, I, they probably don't even remember. My two sisters do know about it. And your yeah. cousin. And then the second one, more people know about it because there was that whole... Definitely. And, and then the belt one, I'm going to guess the belt one a couple of years ago, nobody knows. Just my sister that I talked to not long ago, just a few days ago, she wanted me to open up to her, which was a good thing. We, we had a nice conversation. And my husband, I told him just a few weeks ago because I knew I, knew I was doing this. Oh, so if not for this, you maybe don't have that conversation with him. Right, exactly. How, how does she respond and how does he respond when you tell that to them? My sister started crying. And then my husband, he was pretty horrified, (laughs) not very expressive about it, but I could tell in his face that he was like, oh my God, like, please Mm. don't do anything like that again. And I did 
write, I have a letter, not for any specific attempt, but I have a suicide letter, letter like a general one. Oh, I've never heard of that before. Yeah. Do you have yeah. it with you? Uh, right now, no. I, I don't, I haven't shared that with anyone. Got you. But it's yeah. there. It's there. It exists. Yeah. Now, your, 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 your husband said, please don't do that again. So, you know, if you hear the podcast, one of the questions I ask is, do you think you'll do it again? You're almost 39, right? Right. So you're going to make it to 40? I'll make it to 40, but I don't know, 45. I don't know. Do you think you're going to die by suicide? Natural, <laughs> natural death some other way? I've said it before, actually, to him. I, I'm very open to my husband and I've said, I feel like you're going to die after me. To myself, I've thought, I don't really see other way for me out of here. Like I, I have chron- like chronic pain from all the depressional stuff and stuff. Like I'm, I'm, I have IBS. I'm pretty sure that's due to the whole emotional turmoil that depression has given me. Mm. And I just pretend. I just pretend very well. I'm a master at, pretend, at pretending, but I don't feel well. Like I just, there are moments in my life, you know, that I'm better, I guess. You know, I'm talking to you right now and you ask me how you're doing today. And I'm like, I'm good, but I, it's an automatic response, you, sure. you know, and I don't know how to respond a different way. Right. Yeah. You know, it's funny when people, and, I, and I'm not meaning to compare, but I kind of like when people ask me, how you doing? And even when they like really want to know, it's not just a casual, I, I don't know what to say because I'm like, I'm okay. You know, I, I never say I'm good. I say I'm okay. That's how I feel. And I don't think I'll ever be better than that. I don't think I'm going to end my life. I just don't think I'll ever be bad. And that's not, and that's like a valid way to think. That's how I felt for many, many years. I'm like, yeah. So I don't know. I'm just, it just reminded me of that a little bit of like, what do you say to people? Right. Yeah. And that's when I tell you that I pretend very, very well, like, I, Oh, I'm good. I'm good. It's like, it's automatic. Sure. You know, I just don't know how to step out of that. I don't know how to do it. Like, I don't want to sound pessimistic by saying, no, I'm not good. I also feel embarrassed saying, oh, I don't, I'm not good. I feel like people don't want to hear that. Like, why if someone at work or anywhere else asks me, how are you? How are you? Well, why would I say, no, not very good. It's- Is it even harder to talk about this stuff in Venezuela? I think so, because I grew up around... Catholicism and my right. mom is is very religious. Of course, when I came out of the closet, you know, she was like, "Do you want to go talk to a priest?" My dad didn't give a crap. He didn't care. It was just like uh-huh. very easy going about it. But God forbid that I mentioned that she was very dramatic about it because she it's not a lot of issues come from family in general. But that would be a very long conversation. <laughs> um, yeah, family family noted podcast. <laughs> so my mom is you cannot point out to her how she probably wasn't the best mother in a certain way she's very mm-hmm. loving but maybe you did something wrong she doesn't want to hear about it that's a no-no she will completely guilt you and a lot of those things have marked me growing yeah. up and have caused trauma I know there's no way to know the answer to this question, but just speculate. If you had never left Venezuela, so that's over 20 years ago now. Yeah. And you had stayed there. I realize there's some major political things that make life very difficult there for people. Uh Separate that. I I know you can't, but just separate that. Do you think your life would be just as challenging there from a psychological, emotional? It's very hard, but let's say yeah. Venezuela is like more like Colombia or Mexico with struggles, but not right. as horrible as Venezuela. I'd probably be happier mm. because I'd have my friends from, or well, my best friend from high school probably would have been able to get my degree sooner. I got my, I got a degree and I was 36, a bachelor's degree. And I was able to go back to school because of my husband, because I got right. my card and all of that. He works for uh, the university I went to. So, you know, he helped me out in terms of finances and all that. But that's not what I wanted. Like, and, and that's the pressure that I received from the family. Not only me, my sisters and my cousins, we grew up with certain pressures, uh, certain expectations. I think it broke my heart when I couldn't go to school. Mm. When I moved here and I couldn't go 
to school the way that my sisters did. Yeah, that was heartbreaking for me. Yeah, you know, when you said the word broken heart, I bet I, I don't know this to be true, but I've had over 100 conversations. I've had a lot of conversations now, and I know people like to try to figure out why people try to end their lives. I don't know if there's an answer, but among other reasons, one of the things I think is right towards the top of the list is, is broken hearts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like I said, when we started talking, like he, if you had talked to me two weeks ago, I probably would have started crying. I was in the very back mm -hmm. right now, probably because, you know, I had a shot of alcohol and I took that Kratom. Um, <laughs> I'm better. Kratom and Sambuca do, 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 do magic. Yeah, I guess. How many people in the entire world do you have if you're having a shitty day or a shitty moment and you're like, you know what, I just, I just want someone to talk to that will listen or whatever it is that you want. How many people are there? And I ask this as of almost everybody I talk to. Um, my two sisters, my yeah. husband and my niece. Four people. All right. Yeah, four people. I don't, I don't really have any close friends. You know, I, it's very hard for me to make friends. I feel like I've become very sort of judgmental in the sense that I want to meet people that, you know, with substance. And like I said before, like a lot of friendships right now, they're just fake. It's all in the surface, you know, and I don't like people that are not kind. I don't know. I just expect maybe too much from friendships. And that's really hard to find, especially when I'm almost 40. Yes, it gets, it's challenging when we get older for sure. Was there one main reason why you chose to, after you learned about the podcast and heard it, like to actually email me and then actually follow through and ultimately talk? I think it's important to share, like mm -hmm. if you're willing to, your story for mm -hmm. other people to listen, it's good. Because, you know, listening to all the episodes, mm -hmm. I feel like there's other people out there that, you know, might feel the way I do fine. They tell you, you're not alone. You're not alone. You're not alone. But for me, at least it's not convincing. And I don't know if it's like, you no know, misery loves company or something. It, it probably does. Yep. Sure. Yeah. But when you listen to other people talk about it and express themselves and realize that they're in that situation as well, it's like, wow, I'm not alone. And I can identify with this person. Also, I don't think it's, it's something to be ashamed about. Like suicide is something that's very real. And I don't think it's first, I don't think people should make you feel like you're not brave enough to actually live. Mm -hmm. You know, they tell you you're being selfish. I don't know. My mentality regarding, regarding that is like, it's, it's my body. It's my life. Mm -hmm. If you're going to cry for me, you know, like my mom told me, you know, if you die, you kill me. You know, when I came out, you told me to go see a priest. You don't remember that, but God forbid I say that. One of my younger cousins, he attempted suicide Ooh. actually by hanging. He was 14. He survived, but he was actually in the hospital. He was very shocking to everyone. But then, you know, I'm there. Mm. The, the whole family is together. I hear them telling him, you know, stay here with us. No, not him because not directly to him. I don't know when this happened, but I remember being there that night when they took him to the hospital. My aunts and my mom were very, of course, shaken. They were crying and stuff. But it's the same kind of like pulling on the talk. Like, we just want to let him know that we accept him how he is because, I don't know, he's like struggling with his sexuality. I'm not really sure because that's something that I haven't really got into. Uh, I try to stay away from my family as much as I can. Not my nuclear family, but even them, sometimes I just get enough from them. It's like too much. I get too anxious. The kind of talk is just the same. It's like, just we accept you as you are. You know, you don't have to worry about what people think. It was like, that does nothing. Right. The best way to help someone that just try to kill themselves is just let them know I'm here for you. But sometimes they, don't, they really don't want to talk to or hear the opinion from others, especially from people that haven't really experienced that or any high level of depression. If it's someone that you know attempted suicide and has has struggled a lot with depression or anxiety or whatever, maybe they can be there can be a, a relationship there or a better conversation conversation mm -hmm. in terms of I understand what you're saying. I feel that too. But you know, I would never go to my mom or my parents in general or 
any of my aunts to talk about my suicide attempts. They're not going to get it. They're not going to get it. Yeah. They're not going to get it. At least my sisters, they listen, you know, they don't judge it. They get scared, but they're, they're really good listeners. The same thing with my husband. Of course, they tell me, well, we don't want you to die. We love you very much. And that's a normal thing to say. When they go to the extreme to tell you, it doesn't matter what people say. It's really just not their place. It's really not, it really does nothing. Platitudes. Yeah, exactly. I found it hard to talk to my cousin Mm -hmm. because I'm not very extroverted. You know, he intimidates me a little bit because he's a very intelligent kid. (laughs) Sometimes I'm like, what did you just say? And my social anxiety, like for me, family gatherings take a lot of work. As I get older, it gets worse. It doesn't get better. You know, there's people that say it gets better. It gets better. I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know about not that. Always true. But they're not correct. Yeah. Sometimes it does. So oftentimes it doesn't. It's just not true. Yeah. And, the, I, and that's not negative. That like, you've got to be real with people. Sometimes it doesn't get better. Let's like, stop being dishonest. Stop bullshitting people. Sometimes it gets better. Sometimes it doesn't. I'm sure there are people out there, especially younger, if I had to guess that really want to hear everything's going to be better. Everything's going to be better. And there's some value there. Most of the time, I don't, I think people just want well, truth. It's so. people in a, in a bad place because there, there's an expectation there. I was like, but when? I was like, I'm tired of waiting. I feel like it's a, like if they're going to decide not to do something, if they're going to decide on changing themselves because they want to be here, it's, it's a very personal work. Read. If you want to read, if you find a hobby or something, but it's not my place to to even say that, you know, like you find the work on your own. Personally, I like to read about it. I try to find hobbies. I paint, I make necklaces, all these things to distract me from thoughts that are damaging. Um, I try to walk. I live very close to the beach. Those things to keep me, you know, occupied and bring me pleasure. And even, and even sometimes I'm walking by the beach. I'm like, this is horrible. You know, like this is, doing nothing for me but it's um it takes time like if you really want to really try to not die <laughs> just to survive whatever it is that you're living and accept the shittiness that's around you and try to look at it from a different perspective like well this is yeah shitty but fuck it it's life so you know you do your own work but i'm not gonna tell someone it's gonna get better you know just look right. at it from the positive side. I'm like, no, no. Like, I, I don't like that attitude at all. I'm not, I'm not a very cheery person in <laughs> that aspect at all. Yeah, I don't like that kind of talk. Mr. Jose in Florida, what else you got, man? Anything else you want to add? A question I didn't ask? Basically, you know, just follow your own arrow. I mean, this is for other people that will listen to this. If you sure. feel like I mean, suicide is an option for you. You know, just think about it thoroughly. I'm not going to, nobody should tell you not to do it, please. You know, it's a very personal thing. It's a very mm-hmm. personal thing. There's nothing courageless. Is that a word? Nothing. Um, nothing what would like, be the word? Like not having courage? Yeah. Because that's something else. Like, you know, mm-hmm. people, they say that people that kill themselves, they don't have the the courage to right. confront right. life. Mm-hmm. That's bullshit. How can how do you tell that to a 14-year-old or a 13-year-old that attempted suicide? How do you tell them you're not brave enough to confront life? That's it, that's very damaging. Completely irresponsible. Right. You know, it's people do that. People do that. Even okay. people that are trying to help, it's very counterproductive. It's not, it's not right. It's a, like I said, you know, yeah, parents can be there for those kids, but don't try to put them to follow your method, your way of life. Just let them figure it out on their own. Try to tell them I'm here. But if they, if that's their decision, I was like, I mean, it it sounds bad for anyone, you know, like it's their decision, you know, it's like, I wouldn't get in. Do what you have to do. Mm, Yeah. Um, Well, thank you. Number one, thank you. And uh, I appreciate you being open. And uh, I know it was challenging for you and you were nervous. So uh, you did great. Thank you so much. Awesome, Jose. Thank you so much. And uh, and I'll talk to you soon. I hope your night goes well. Yours as well. Have All a right. good night. Bye. Ciao. Bye. As always, thanks so much for listening and all of your support. And special thanks to Jose 
down in Florida. Thanks very much, Jose. If you are a suicide attempt survivor and you'd like to talk, please reach out. Hello at SuicideNoted.com or on Facebook or Twitter at Suicide Noted. I've included in the show notes a couple of ways you can support the podcast in addition to listening and letting people know about it and rating and reviewing it if you listen on Apple. All of those things, we really appreciate it. And that is all for episode number 102. Stay strong. Do the best you can. I'll talk to you soon. When we made our McDonald's spicy chicken McNuggets, you were praise hands emoji. Then we ran out, and you were streaming tears emoji. Now they're back, so you can be grinning face with sweat emoji. Order ahead on the McDonald's app. Spicy chicken McNuggets are back. Now get a free six-piece spicy chicken McNuggets with purchase of a dollar or more. Offer only on the app. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. Offer valid once daily through 4.30 at participating McDonald's. App download and registration required.